Get ready to uncover the captivating story of one man's journey into the depths of psychological manipulation. Discover how he mastered the art of tapping into your deepest desires and fears, all in the pursuit of profit. From transforming soap into a status symbol, convincing women that smoking equals freedom, and manipulating the US government into invading another democratic nation. This is a tale of intrigue, power, and the darker side of human persuasion. Using those as examples, I will break down the psychological techniques this man employed, which are still in use today. And hopefully, you'll understand why Life magazine named him as one of the most influential people of the 20th century. First, let's look at his background and how he entered the world of public relations. And what the doctor is, what are we dealing with well, here? The father of uh, public relations. What we're dealing with really is the concept that people will believe me more if you call me doctor. Oh, I see. <laughs> Born Edward Louis Benes on November 22nd, 1891 in Vienna, Austria. He was part of a family with intellectual and creative roots, including his uncle, the renowned psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. Benes was from an early age surrounded by an intellectual atmosphere that would help shape his understanding of the human mind. As a child, Bernays migrated with his family to the United States. An early bloomer intellectually, he embarked on his academic journey at Cornell University at the tender age of 16. He graduated in 1912 with a degree in agriculture. It was, however, in the bustling streets of New York where Edward Bernays found himself at a crossroads that would shape the trajectory not only of his career but Western consumerism and the future of entire countries. A fateful encounter with his old school friend, Fred Robinson, as he boarded the 9th Avenue trolley on a brisk December morning, sparked a collaboration that would mark the start of Bernays' venture into the world of influence. In 1912, weeks following that pivotal meeting, Bernays assumed the role of co-editor alongside Robinson for the Medical Review of Reviews and Dietic and Hygienic Gazette. Their editorial stance championed things like taking showers and opposing corsets. Their first break came two months after they joined forces, when a doctor submitted a glowing review of a play called Damaged Goods, which, controversially for the time, dealt with venereal disease and prostitution. Bernays called it a propaganda play that fought for sex education. Bernays published the doctor's review, a bold step, given their conservative audience. Then they went a step further. They read that Richard Bennett, a leading actor, was interested in producing damaged goods. So Bernays wrote to him saying, The editors of the Medical Review of Reviews support your praiseworthy intention to fight sex purency in the United States by producing damaged goods. You can count on our help. Bennett quickly accepted the offer, pumping up the young editor with visions of a crusade against Victorian morals promising to recruit actors who would work without pay and prodding him to raise money for the production. Bernays was so excited that he volunteered to underwrite the production. The key with damaged goods, he realized, was to transform the controversy into a cause and recruit backers who already were public role models. Bernays, ever the strategist, then established a front organization called the Medical Review of Reviews Sociological Fund Committee. With a stroke of ingenuity, he rallied the support of influential figures, including the likes of J.D. Rockefeller Jr., Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, and leading industrialists of the time. Although the organization purported to fight sexually transmitted disease, its sole purpose was to endorse and profit from Bennett's play. The committee was more effective than anyone dreamed. Hundreds of checks poured in. This was the first time that Bernays, or anyone else for that matter, had assembled quite such a distinguished front group, and its success ensured not only that Bernays would use this technique repeatedly, but also that PR organizations will continue to employ it today. Damaged Goods, meanwhile, was a huge hit. Presented before overflow audiences in New York, then heading to the National Theatre in Washington, and a performance before Supreme Court justices, members of the President's Cabinet and congressmen from across the country. Its success at the box office was even more impressive, given that most reviewers agreed that it was dull and almost unendurable. What mattered more was that the production, in the words of one editorial, made it strike six o'clock in America, precisely the note the boy editors were aiming for. 
This alliance of celebrity and finance, forging the crucible of societal change, marked the beginning of Benazi's journey into the art of influence and the strategic orchestration of social narratives. Interestingly, not long after damaged goods, he travelled to Carlsbad in what is now the Czech Republic to talk over his recent exploits with his uncle, Sigmund Freud. On this trip, he and Freud took long walks in the woods. However, it's not known what the pair talked about, but whatever the specifics of their conversation, it is clear that when Bernays returned to New York in the autumn of 1913, he was more taken than ever with Freud's novel theories. Embracing Freud's psychoanalytical theory early on, Bernays found it to be a crucial foundation for understanding human motivation. Freud's premise, highlighting the influence of unconscious desires on people's actions, became a cornerstone in the development of his public relations strategies. And Bernays was convinced that understanding the instincts and symbols that motivate an individual could help him shape the behavior of the masses. In order to fully understand the power Bernays had in influencing public opinion, it's better just to look at some of the campaigns he ran and the change in society he caused. In the following campaign, he turned a simple bar of soap into a status symbol. In the early 1920s, ivory soap was an established household item, known for its purity and floating properties. However, in the competitive realm of consumer goods, Bernays saw an opportunity to elevate a simple bar of soap into a symbol of modernity, sophistication, and most importantly, social status. Bernays approached his task with a holistic understanding of psychology and marketing. He recognized that merely extolling the virtues of Irish soap's purity wouldn't capture the public imagination. Instead, he set out to craft a narrative that would intertwine the product with the deepest desires and aspirations of the American people. The first stroke of his ingenious brush involved tapping into the eclectic desire for progress and modernity. In an era marked by technological advancements and a quest for the new, Bernays positioned ivory soap as a symbol of cleanliness in a rapidly evolving world. The message was clear. In this modern age, one needed a soap that reflected the spirit of progress and ivory was the embodiment of that ethos. To further embed ivory soap into the fabric of American life, Bernays orchestrated a series of events that would marry the product with societal values. Leveraging the burgeoning medium of radio, he sponsored soap carbon competitions, encouraging families to engage in creative pursuits with ivory as the centerpiece. The subtle implication was that those who used ivory soap were not just consumers, they were participants in a cultural movement, elevating the soap to a status beyond the utilitarian. Simultaneously, Bernays recognized the power of endorsements in shaping public perception. He strategically enlisted the support of influential figures from doctors to celebrities to champion the benefits of ivory soap. Through carefully crafted testimonials and endorsements, Bernays aimed to create an aura of credibility around the product, positioning it not just as a soap, but a lifestyle choice endorsed by the authorities of the time. The pinnacle of Bernays' ivory soap campaign, however, lay in his ability to tap into the subconscious desires of the American consumer. Building on Freudian concepts, he understood that purchasing decisions were often driven by emotions and unconscious motivations. In a stroke of marketing genius, he subtly associated the use of ivory soap with a sense of purity and moral virtue. The famous slogan, 99 and 44 100% pure, became more than a numerical representation of the soap's composition. It transformed into a powerful psychological trigger. Bernays framed the purity of ivory as a reflection of the user's own moral purity, subtly implying that choosing any other soap would be a compromise on one's values. The soap became a metaphorical cleanser, not just for the body, but for the soul. To cement this connection, Bernays strategically positioned ivory soap as a family soap, tapping into the emotional wellspring of family bonds and shared values. Advertisements depicted awesome scenes of mothers bathing their children with ivory, reinforcing the idea that choosing this soap was a conscious decision to provide the best for one's family. As the ivory soap campaign unfolded, the impact on sales was nothing short of extraordinary. The soap that was once seen as a basic commodity became a cultural sensation, a symbol of an aspirational lifestyle. 
The Nay is not just sold a product, he had sold an idea, a narrative that embedded ivory soap into the very identity of the American consumer. The legacy of Bernays' ivory soap campaign extended far beyond the immediate success. It laid the groundwork for a paradigm shift in marketing, emphasizing the importance of storytelling, psychology, and emotion in shaping consumer behavior. The techniques he pioneered from associating products with lifestyle choices to tapping into the subconscious desires became the cornerstone of modern advertising. In this next and arguably his most famous campaign, Bernays managed to link smoking with a woman's quest for equality. In the smoky haze of 1920s America, Bernays seized upon a moment that would spark a cultural revolution. At the art of this transformation was his audacious campaign, Torches of Freedom, a meticulously crafted narrative that would forever alter the landscape of gender norms and societal expectations. Bernays, with his unique understanding of the human psyche, recognized that tapping into deep-seated desires and emotions was the key to influencing public opinion. In the aftermath of World War I, societal norms were in flux, and the fight for women's suffrage had left a lasting mark on the collective consciousness. It was in this climate of change that Bernay set his sights on reshaping the perception of women and, by extension, the products they consumed. The battleground for this transformative campaign was cigarettes, a product primarily associated with men. Smoking was not only a social taboo for women, but also considered a rebellious act that defied the traditional feminine image. Bernays, however, saw an opportunity to liberate women from these constraints, while simultaneously expanding the market for his client, the American Tobacco Company. In 1928, Bernays created one huge audacious plan that would challenge gender norms and tap into the desires of women. He chose a symbol laden with meaning and imbued it with a narrative, the cigarette as a torch of freedom. The idea was simple yet profound. Women lighting up cigarettes would not only signify their emancipation, but also embody a bold declaration of independence. To launch this paradigm shifting campaign, Bernays strategically targeted a potent platform, the New York City Easter Parade, an annual event attended by throngs of spectators and media. He discreetly organized a group of young women to march in the parade, ostentatiously smoking cigarettes as a deliberate act of defiance. Photographers, who Bernays paid, captured the moment, and the images spread like wildfire through newspapers and magazines, immortalizing the spectacle of women with torches of freedom. Simultaneously, Bernays worked behind the scenes to cultivate endorsements from women of influence. Suffragettes and feminists were enlisted to champion the cause, framing smoking as a symbolic act of equality and empowerment. The message was clear, smoking was just not a pleasurable pastime, it was a revolutionary gesture, a manifestation of the involving role of women in society. The brilliance of the Torches of Freedom campaign lay in its fusion of product promotion with a broader narrative of societal change. Bernays understood that to sell an idea, one needed to tap into the emotions and aspirations of the target audience. In this case, he was not merely selling cigarettes, he was selling the idea of women as agents of change, challenging conventions and asserting their autonomy. The impact was immediate and profound. The Torches of Freedom campaign ignited a cultural shift, redefining smoking as a symbol of liberation for women. Cigarette sales among women soared and the once taboo act became a statement of progress and empowerment. The campaign had successfully transformed the products associated with rebellion into a beacon of progress. Yet the ramifications of the Torches of Freedom campaign extended beyond the realm of marketing. Bernays had inadvertently become an architect of social change, using his understanding of psychology and narrative to dismantle gender stereotypes. The Torches of Freedom campaign remains a classic in the world of public relations one still cited in classrooms and boardrooms, as an example of its creative analysis of social symbols and how they can be manipulated. In the next and our final example campaign, Bernays influenced the opinion of the US government and destroyed a nation. Bernays, now an established virtuoso of public relations, found himself entangled in a complex web of power, influence and morality 
when he undertook a campaign that would forever alter the destiny of the nation, Guatemala. The year was 1954, and the United States was gripped by the paranoia of the Cold War. As the spectre of communism loomed large, Benes, with his unparalleled skills in shaping public opinion, played a pivotal role in orchestrating a narrative that would lead to the overthrow of a democratically elected government. This stage was set in Guatemala, a country with a history marked by political turbulence and social inequality. Jacobo R. Benz, a military officer, had risen to power as the president of Guatemala in 1951, championing a progressive agenda that sought to address issues of land reform and wealth disparity. R. Benz's policies, seen as a threat to the interests of powerful multinational corporations, particularly the United Fruit Company, triggered a response that would draw Bernays into a morally ambiguous stance. United Fruit, a behemoth in the fruit industry, owned vast expanses of land in Guatemala. R. Benz's land reform initiatives aimed to redistribute these lands to the impoverished masses, challenging the privileged position of the company. In the eyes of the American government and corporations, R. Benz's actions were viewed through the lens of the burgeoning Cold War, where any hint of socialist influence was considered a threat to the capitalist way of life. Enter Edward Bernays, the man who had here to shape public opinion for corporate interests. Hired by the United Fruit Company, Bernays embarked on a campaign that would skillfully blend propaganda, media manipulation and political intrigue. His objective was clear, to cast R. Benz's government as a puppet of Soviet influence thus justifying its removal in the eyes of the American people and policymakers. Bernays, drawing from his extensive toolkit of psychological techniques, framed the situation in Guatemala as a battle between freedom and the encroaching menace of communism. Through carefully crafted press releases, articles and statements, he propagated the narrative that Guatemala, under Arbenz, was a potential Soviet satellite in the heart of the Americas. The term communist became a potent weapon invoking fear and suspicion among the American public. One of Bernays' key tactics was to manipulate the media landscape. Today we would call it fake news. He disseminated carefully curated information to journalists, shaping the narrative that would be presented to the American public. Newspapers, magazines and radio broadcasts echoed the sentiments sung by Bernays, painting a dire picture of Guatemala as a battleground in the global struggle against communism. The term Banana Republic found its roots in this campaign, painting a picture of political instability that justified intervention. Simultaneously, Bernays orchestrated a campaign aimed at the United States government, particularly the Eisenhower administration. Leveraging his connections and influence, he assured that decision makers received a steady stream of information portraying Arbenz as a communist sympathizer, a dangerous ally of the Soviet Union. The campaign reached its zenith when Secretary of State John Foster Duales, whose law firm had previously represented the United Fruit Company, declared that R. Benz's government had to be removed to safeguard American interests. The propaganda machine was in full swing, and the United States, under the guise of protecting democracy, orchestrated a coup in Guatemala. In 1954, with the support of the CIA, the US government engineered the overthrow of R. Benz replacing him with a puppet regime more amenable to the American corporate interests. The impact on the Guatemalan society was profound and far-reaching. The overthrow of Arbenz resulted in a series of repressive military regimes that would govern Guatemala for decades. The void left by the removal of a democratically elected leader was filled by leaders whose loyalty lay not with the Guatemalan people, but with the interests of foreign powers and corporations. The social and economic reforms championed by Arbenz were reversed, perpetuating the cycle of poverty and inequality that had plagued the country for years. The United Fruit Company, having successfully eliminated a perceived threat to its dominance, continued to exert its influence over Guatemala's resources. The exploitation of the country's labour and natural wealth persisted, leaving the Guatemalan people disenfranchised and subjected to the whims of external forces. Edward Bernays, the man who had shaped desires and perceptions for corporations, had now left a lasting mark on the geopolitical landscape. His involvement in Guatemala stands as a cautionary tale about the unchecked power of propaganda. It raises moral dilemmas when influence is wielded without regard for the consequences on the lives of those who become mere pawns in the game of power and profit. Now let's break down some of his techniques, so hopefully by being aware of them, they become less powerful.
East Craft wasn't just about selling products. It was about selling dreams, aspirations, and a lifestyle that beckoned people to reach for more, even if they didn't realize they needed it. Bernays' influence on consumer behavior was more than advertisements. He made psychological narratives that tapped into the deepest recesses of the human mind. He understood that to sell something, you didn't just highlight its utility, you sold the story, emotion, and a lifestyle. As we can gather from the examples I have given, we can start to understand this overarching methodology for influencing you. Number one, symbolism. This is where a product represents a concept higher than itself. When a product is sold based on emotions and desires, it's far more powerful than just selling based on facts. Two, influencers. This is where advertisers use influential figures and link them to a product. Bernays believed that influencing the people at the top of the social hierarchy will cause that influence to cascade downwards. One famous person can easily influence thousands of people. So advertisers only need to persuade that one person to spread the marketing message to their thousands of followers. Three, group norms. This is where advertisers create or alter what is normal among a target group. For example, by enforcing a social pressure on consumers that would force them to buy something just to fit in. Four, mental space. Bernays understood that a consumer's mental space was the holy grail of advertising. Securing a safe spot in as many minds as possible was the prime objective. For that reason, he believed in advertising everywhere. Newspapers, magazines, radio, it was all necessary. The total amount of mental space available was limited, and so competition for it was intense. Before Bernays' ideas were understood and applied, advertisements were a very matter-of-fact affair. Products were sold purely based on their features and usefulness. Although it may seem obvious now, Bernays used his knowledge of psychology to show that more profit could be made if corporations could use advertisements to fulfill a human desire so that people wouldn't buy a product, but they would buy an answer to an unfilled human need. All advertisers needed to do was to link their product to some deep emotional longing. It is for this linkage that Bernays is regarded as the pioneer of public relations. His influence radically changed the persuasion tactics used in campaign advertising and political campaigns. His techniques, once revolutionary, had become ingrained in the modus operandi of advertisers and marketeers worldwide. The subconscious has been laid bare, an open book for those who sought to wield its power. Bernays described the masses as irrational and subject to herd instinct, and outlined how skilled practitioners could use crowd psychology and psychoanalysis to control them in desirable ways. Bernays believed that he and other propagandists know what is beneficial for the common good. This is a common trait among dictators, and a theme that appears over and over again in his work. He truly believed that most people were stupid sheep that needed an elite and intelligent class to shepherd them. That is a concept he got from Walter Lippmann. He was Bernays' unacknowledged American mentor and greatly influenced his ideas expressed in his books. To find out more about Walter Lippmann, click on the video shown.